Thank you. Uh, we needed to wait one minute for the streaming, but uh, thank you, Carmen, for, for introducing us. Uh, I'm Monica Bello, uh, and I'll be moderating or facilitating this conversation around the theme and revealing the unseen. Uh, I'm the curator and the head of arts at CERN, and I'd like to start uh, by saying uh, that it's been such a pleasure to collaborate uh, with Mapping Festival. In, this is our first time, but it's hopefully not the last one. And, uh, and especially in this Paradigm Shift Forum, uh, curated by Carmen Salas. So thank you, Carmen, Anna, uh, Justine, Vincent, and all the team of the, uh, of the festival for the kind invitation. So uh, I come from CERN, which is just here outside Geneva, and many of you might know or might even visit it at some point. CERN, as you might know, is the European Organization for Nuclear Research. It's been uh, running for the over uh, 60 years, uh, and is one of the most uh, uh, pioneering and leader labs, as well as the largest lab dedicated to particle physics in the world. The focus of CERN is quite singular. Uh, it's a place where uh, 3,000 engineers and scientists uh, dedicate all the efforts to look at the structure of uh, the universe and to understand through developing and working on very complex machines and very large machines as well, to, to focus on the study of the basic constituents of matter, which is the fundamental particles. The image that you are seeing behind my behind me shows a very recent collision. It's a very fresh image from the Large Hadron Collider Beauty Detector. And this happens yesterday. I've been in CERN almost uh, three years. And uh, now I can say that uh, this image, uh, image uh, give, gives me a huge excitement because I see my colleagues at CERN really getting so excited and so happy because the first collisions are going to provide them with data to keep the research after four months of uh, being the machine uh, shut down. So this is a, a really nice coincidence to be here with you talking today about art and science at CERN and uh, elsewhere uh, and seeing the collision happening just last night. Um, with all these excited scientists just sharing and the, uh, the expectations for the next few months. Uh, well, this image also uh, shows the way the scientists uh, reach or uh, visualize data and the information that is provided by uh, uh, colliding uh, protons in uh, this huge uh, prototype, which is the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, particle physics, uh, the focus and the dedication uh, at CERN is the, the, this huge, but the still very marginal domain, is uh, one of the most um, uh, tough areas for understanding in general public, and is one of the most uh, amazing uh, areas of fundamental research. Everything that happens at CERN is dedicated to a single goal, which is pushing the boundaries of knowledge, understanding better the world we live in, the nature, the, the way uh, the, our universe and our reality is, uh, our material reality is formed. So, uh, these 3,000 people, and on top of that, uh, 10,000 more around the world are looking at how to do this without thinking of application in industry, which eventually happens, but uh, it's important for me to emphasize that it's a place dedicated to fundamental research and for thinking, um, looking at failures, 
very, uh, very often. So it's always a challenge to think how an artist can be located there in this environment. It's a challenge because we identified uh, many opportunities, but also many obstacles. And I think this is uh, one of the topics of our conversation today that uh, we'll, I'll be happy to uh, uh, motivate and reflect on. Um, CERN is a place where numerous uh, researchers from all over the world cross paths and interact with each other every single day. And this synergy, as I've been said uh, by uh, some colleague scientists, is often better expressed by the arts, which always uh, gives me uh, huge re reassurance and, uh, jo uh, uh, and joy. Each time we bring an artist at, uh, at CERN, uh, we think that it's unique. In that sense, I never uh, or I will never be able to think again about art and science as a single domain. Uh, each residency, each visit uh, provides an opportunity for a new dialogue, a new uh, experience about the connectivity uh, and the connectivities that exist between artists and scientists between two uh, um, different practitioners that are really uh, build the culture of today. And, uh, and it really gives me uh, hope uh, in the sense that we are looking at a way of um, uh, working on research and understanding knowledge from different areas. Uh, artists approach scientific concepts and implications in a different manner than scientists. Uh, we cannot really be uh, naive enough to say that uh, uh, they are equal and they look at the world in the same way. But I think um, and um, the cap capability of stepping back and appreciating the research topic allows both of them to find new paths to solve problems or new ways to interpret results. This is something that is common and is uh, very close from artist to scientist. And, uh, and I, th I think and I've been considering that uh, precisely when a scientist works with an artist, uh, uh, finds the opportunity to uh, remember the scale of the research and the way it's done and how ultimate, ultimately uh, the research is uh, explained to society itself. So for us, at Art Satsang is a remarkable experience to follow, guide and curate the different uh, ideas that come out of this process and how they might interact to the circumstances of scientific research in fundamental science and especially in this domain which I think is really unique of particle physics. Particle physics is an intangible uh, science. You cannot grasp anything with, uh, anything with your senses, with your hands, even with your thinking. Uh, it requires not only a huge amount of imagination and creativity, but also a capability that is only trained by learning, knowledge and expertise through many years. Uh, so when artists uh, are talk with uh, scientists at CERN, they, f they need to build up strategies and a new language and reset very often how they understand things um, and uh, what is peculiar about this particular science. Our guests uh, today have solid uh, practice and experience in science, technology and research environments and I, I think I, I'll just uh, uh, pass the microphone to them because um, 
this is an ongoing conversation, which uh, for me, for the last three years, I realized that there is nothing certain that, uh, as I said before, it comes very much on individual experience. So I'd like to hear what uh, Ruth Jarman here on my right has to say about what I just said, and but uh, most especially about the experience you had in other research labs as well as at CERN because you, you've you been with us for two months uh, last year and still coming back. <laughs> as artist in residence uh, uh, in the Collide program. Uh, and Martin House, uh, you've been researching and being preoccupied, as you say in your biography, with artistic investigation and the links between the earth, the phenomena, and uh, software and the human psyche. So I think it's very interesting to, uh, I'm very interested to, to hear your thoughts. And I, I hand the microphone first to you. Thanks, Monica. Um, could you just send it to black and I'll just swap that over. Okay. So um, I work as part of an artist duo called Semiconductor, and this is a photograph of me and my partner Joe, Joe Gerhardt, and this was taken during our residency at CERN at the end of 2015, where we spent about 10 weeks. Um, over the 20 years that we've been working together, we've spent lots of time in different science labs all over the world. And initially, this was driven by an interest that we have in the material nature of the physical world and then how we experience that. Um, more specifically, matter which exists beyond the limits of our perceptions. So we were interested in the things you can't see or hear or perhaps events that occur over geological time frames or very small time frames like that happens at CERN. Um, and naturally, this led us to turn to the tools and processes of science to start reveal these things to us. But when we were at a space sciences lab in America, um, we were talking with a solar physicist called Janet Lumen, and she said to us, science is a human invention. It's nature that's real. Um, and we thought this kind of gave us a license to start questioning the process of science. So up until that point, we thought we'd just been interested in using the technology and the processes to reveal matter to us. But we'd started to notice that there was a kind of certain signature that came with the science that suggested a human observer. And through asking more philosophical questions of science, we became interested in this signature and then started looking for this signature in science. Um, so I'm just going to briefly introduce three pieces of work which I think um, deal with this idea of revealing the unseen um, in different ways and these ideas of the signature and then also emphasizing man as an observer of the world. Um, and the first piece is a piece of work called Black Rain. And the image you see here is an installation version. We produced an installation version and a single channel piece of work. And the image is taken from an instrument on a satellite called Stereo. So the instrument's heliospheric imager, which is a UK instrument that's on a NASA satellite mission. And the satellites, one of them sits ahead of the Earth and one of them sits behind the Earth. And as they rotate uh, around the sun, they're looking at the space between the sun and the Earth. And they're looking at capturing the coronal mass ejections that come from the sun. And the idea was if they had two vantage points, they could try and build a three-dimensional image of what was happening with these coronal mass ejections and try to understand it more. Um, we'd already made a piece of work working with so visual solar data called Brilliant Noise um, when we were at the Space Sciences Lab. And what became really apparent to us is the kind of data that is actually being captured and the data that's saying being revealed to the public or that you might see on science documentaries um, are wildly different. The data that even the scientists work with themselves is heavily processed. 
So they'll have algorithms, and you'll all be familiar with the Hubble Space Telescope, which presents us with these beautiful colour images of deep space, um, when in reality there are hundreds of images composited together and the colours introduced and it's all cleaned up. So we start to get this kind of... Um, this kind of almost this sense of nature which isn't isn't real but we start to believe it in some way so we wanted to go back um, to what we refer to as the raw data with black rain and we'd met the UK scientist on this mission and he was happy to help us access the data so we worked with a technician to go back to the raw data so this is data that as it's come down, sent down from the satellite and it hasn't been processed in any way and we're interested in all the artifacts and errors and the signature of the technology that you get. So, for example, all these white lines, are either pixels blowing out or something that's called blooming, you have all the kind of um, white light coming from the corner as kind of scattered light that's come from within the instrument. So all of these things are normally removed, either because the scientists aren't interested or they interfere with the science they're actually looking for, or just to make the images more pretty so they can release them for kind of public consumption. So we were interested in really encouraging this noise and artifacts and the presence of the technology so that we could emphasize man as a human observer. There's always this idea about science being very objective. Um, and a, a title that we've just come up for for a recent show is The View from Nowhere. So science is the idea that you're not viewing nature from anywhere. There's no viewpoint. But in our work, we're kind of bringing that subjectivity back into the work by emphasising the viewpoint of man looking out. So I'll just... Um, I'm going to play the three-minute film version of this to give you a better idea. And there's sound with this.
So that was a piece of work that we made in 2009, and that kind of imagery has become more familiar since then. Something quite interesting happened um, that the BBC were making. There was a series in the UK called Wonders of the Solar System, and it was the first po program that Brian Cox, a scientist from CERN, um, was presenting. And they wanted to use some of this footage. And so they went to the scientists. They'd seen our work, and they went to the scientists and said, we want to use some of that data that Semiconductor have used. And the scientist, Chris, he's a lovely guy, and he said, well, that's Semiconductor's work because they've decided how it wants to look. Because essentially, when you get one image from the satellite, it's just black, and you decide how much information you bring out in that image. And so he actually decided that it was our work. So the BBC paid us to have it in one of the solar system, and then we ended up getting credited above NASA in the credits, which was kind of embarrassing, um, but that's how it worked. So, and since then, they have um, started to go back looking for raw data when they're trying to do their programs and get a sense of the human kind of back into the scientific data. So um, the next piece of work came out of a residency we did at the Mineral Sciences Laboratory in the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C. And this image, um, I think, is quite a good representation of the kind of journey that we go on when we do these residencies, that we normally go in um, and the scientists are understandably quite suspicious of us because we don't know exactly what we're doing or we're going to produce um, and in this instance, we had to do quite a lot of persuading with the scientists um, that why we should be there, and they ended up having a democratic vote um, as to whether they wanted artists in the lab or not. But this was towards the end, this photograph was taken towards the end of um, the four-month residency. And it's the photograph to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the museum. And the scientists were quite adamant that we should be in the photograph, that we had as much right to be documented as being there on the 100th anniversary as the rest of the scientists. And I think this is, is something that we see happen a lot in the residencies we do, that we kind of get thrown in the deep end and then people aren't necessarily really interested. And then by the end, people really want to talk to us and they're really excited about the process. Um, so I'm just going to show um, another three-minute clip of a piece of work we made as a result of being there. We finished it quite recently. It's called Where Shapes Come From. And I'll talk a little bit about it afterwards. There's nothing random about the way a group of atoms comes together and starts to bond. It may literally be, you know, one atom bonds to another atom, and you've now got a place where a third atom can come in. Very quickly, though, the pattern of that bonding becomes established. And then everything else that is added to that is being added in a very specific place. Once you start to form a little bit of a pattern, it's energetically much more favorable for the next atom to lock into that pattern than to sort of fight the crowd and decide to try to fit itself in somewhere else.
Um, okay, let's go there. Um, yeah, so um, it didn't sound like the dialogue was very clear actually in there, but I'm sort of, I don't know, I'm behind the speakers, so maybe you could just about hear what Jeff Post was saying. And he's um, a mineralogist at the Mineral Sciences Lab, and we got him to describe the coming together of atoms to form matter. And he described it in a way as if it's happening in front of your eyes so that it brings it into our human realm so we can start to try and create some sort of experience of what it's like of atoms coming together. And he, um, it's something that he does a lot of there. He's doing a lot of experiments where he's looking at mineral crystals and looking at their structure, thinking about the, how the atoms have formed that structure. And we became very interested in the different languages that they're using to try and understand this. So on the one hand, we have Jeff describing these atoms coming together, which kind of tries, does it really give us a window into what's really happening matter? I don't know if language is a bit too limited to be able to do that. But then also visually, we've worked with these computer generated versions of atomic diagrams that are associated with atomic patterns um, to suggest another way that we can try and interpret and understand nature. And the sound that's controlling those animations is uh, seismic data which we've collected online from an archive online that's from the Mariana Trench when, where there's land forming um, at, the, at that trench. And so with this work, we're really interested in questioning how science mediates nature so that we can experience it. So nature that's beyond the limits of our perception. How does science present that to us and how does it affect how we experience nature? Um, and also, yeah, and how it influences our experiences of the physical world. So this is a piece of work called Earthworks that we made last year for Sona Planta, and it was commissioned by Sarige, who are a company, a Spanish company, who own lots of quarries across Spain, and they build a lot of the roads and do a lot of other construction work. And we visited one of their quarries, and it was really apparent that in the face of the quarry, you could read the strata or the layers of the landscape and how it used to be an old riverbed. And over thousands and thousands of years, it had deposited stones, which you could quite clearly see sorted into kind of these different layers. And we went looking for ways that scientists try to understand this or interpret it or can even reconstruct it. And this is Oriol, and he's um, in his analog modeling lab at the University of Barcelona. I mean, this lab could have been anywhere in the world, but it just so happened that the place that we thought were doing the most interesting work in this field was in Barcelona, where the work was going to be installed. So we got to visit the lab and spent a day or two there looking at the process, which is this fish tank. We call it a fish tank. The scientists don't call it a fish tank. Um, here is filled with layers of sand. So they can work with quite particular sizes of layers of sand, and then they can apply... Uh, pressures which represent various tectonic pressures so they can squash it, shake it, move it in all different kind of coordinates and they can start to quite accurately replicate landscape formation. And so we took this um, as, as a process and made a computer generated version of it. So we made a computer environment with millions of particles which were in colourful layers which we, you saw in the beginning. So it's set up as like a 20 metre long projection and then we wanted to bring sound to that, to introduce time to it. So we collected earthquake data from volcanoes, which was the magma moving inside the volcano, glaciers, earthquake data. And then this is us with, um, again, the University of Barcelona and Sarige collecting seismic data in the actual quarry. Um, so there were four chapters to the work. And you hear the seismic data, and then at the same time, the seismic data is controlling and animating these layers until, by the end, um, they're just, it's just pure noise. So I'll just play a little excerpt um, of the documentation of the installation. It's just about a minute and a half long. I probably need to turn the sound. <laughs>
So I'm just going to do a fast minute <laughs> of um, giving a quick overview of how we spent our time during our residency. Um, so this is really just going to be scraping the surface to kind of give a bit of an insight through images about what we got up to. Um, so it's both you know, exhilarating and terrifying being artists in residence in a science lab, as most of the people there have devoted their careers and their whole lives to gaining the skills and knowledge to carry out their science. And we turn up quite specifically very naive about the science because we want to be able to interpret it in our own way. Um, but over time, we've learnt to become more accustomed to kind of throwing ourselves in and understand more of the journey that we go on. And we start off having kind of general themes of interest that we follow, but we, we do as much as we can because we know that perhaps sometimes they'll just come to a dead end or we don't want to go with a very specific idea that's too tied down because quite often you can make things more difficult for yourself. Um, so this was our brilliant scientific partner, Luis Alvarez Gomi, and we met him weekly. We called them our weekly therapy sessions, um, even though they were far from it because he was just constantly trying to pull the rug from under our feet and tell us what we thought were the most ridiculous things. And now a year later, we're starting to understand what the hell he was talking about. Um, and there was another theorist we spent time with, John Ellis, um, and both of these theorists we're revisiting and will become part of a work that we're now making. We spent time in the archive with Anita, who has loads of amazing stuff in there. Um, here we're looking at old bubble cham chamber film from the 1950s. We asked her to show us um, lots of notebooks from scientists. She has all these notebooks that the scientists donate when they retire. We were interested in scientist doodles and scientific doodles, and we consider this to be a scientific doodle. Um, that's a photograph from the bubble chamber, a neutrino chamber. This is quite interesting. Um, there was lots of logbooks where scientists are getting really frustrated with the experiment and just talking about failure and problems all the time. You know, that's a really important part of science is that they're not just providing answers to things. It's much more about asking questions. And, th and this, I don't know if you can read it up there, but it just says conclusion of three hours of running up and down the stairs. And then it progresses to talk about what everything that went wrong with the experiment. So it's kind of like a handover diary to the next person that comes in. These fingerprints we like on this, this kind of, we were interested in the human signature in the science, and um, there's some nice fingerprints on the uh, a literal human signature on this uh, bubble chamber photograph. So lots of interesting documents in the archive that we could pour over for hours. Um, and we spent a lot of time in the workshop where they develop a lot of prototypes for the experiment. So they're working mainly with metals to um, develop interesting parts for the experiments, interesting objects, which in their own rights we feel become part of the language of science and the language that we were interested in. And this, this was something they were making there, and it's a waveguide. And the wave shapes that you can see actually guide particles along. So they're specifically sized for specific particles. I don't really understand what it means, but it's, um, it's, I really like this coming together of this matter that you can't see and then these fantastical objects. And so we're kind of following up ideas to do with those. They're very proud of these, so I felt we shouldn't um, not show those because that's one of their proudest moments. Great, more great photographs from the archive with objects, different um, images that they use to understand processes they're doing in the workshops, lots of photographs of uh, workbenches. And then we spent lots of time in the large magnet facility, which is the building, it's called Building 180, and it's like a huge airport hangar where they put together um, these magnets um, that go in the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider. And we spent a good couple of weeks there filming mostly these guys who were doing some really interesting processes, um, just poking our noses in as much as possible, really, finding the nice kind of detritus that comes with hanging out in a, in a science lab. And um, we are currently making work a year later. I think we, other projects got in the way, like making earthworks. Um, but I feel like we really needed a year to really do justice to the time that we spent at CERN, because there's a lot of big topics you come up against there. It's a huge place. There, there's huge personalities and 
brains and stuff so you just need to, to a lot of time to process things so um, one of the pieces of work we're making is working with data from the atlas experiment and it took us the whole time um, of our residency to keep trying to find the right person to ask if we could work with the data and on the last day we found somebody that said yes so um, that's where we're currently at thank you <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, I give like a short presentation, lecture kind of thing. And the original title was, Why is Everything Hidden? But then I, yeah, somehow I thought, well, why? I don't know. Um, it seemed a bit too extreme. So why, why is there something hidden? So this is like the question which is relating to this notion of visibility, to what science does, to what is kind of involved in the history of science. And I'll start with a quotation which I've used as a kind of motto somehow, or a question throughout my own work for a long time. And this is from Heraclitus, fragment 16. And the ancient Greek more or less translates as, how can one hide before that which never sets? Or there's an alternative, alternative translation, which is, how can one remain concealed before that which never sets? And in fact, there are like, hundreds of potential translations, but this is kind of somehow the inverse of what I'm talking about. So this, I mean, how to say, like things in ancient Greek were obviously quite different to today. So it's more or less like asking like, how can there be anything which is hidden? And the question I'm asking is more or less like, why is everything hidden? Or um, to put it like in another way, why is everything not exposed and on the surface? Like, why is it that to know something of the world involves like digging deeper, looking beneath some kind of supposed surface. There's always this idea of making something invisible visible, like staying at CERN. It's kind of like everything is hidden. Like you see a cafeteria, you see some birds, some crows, everything is underground. This knowledge is something which is going deep, like what you were talking about, something which you can't even imagine or express, or there is not even any language. But how did it come about that the world becomes something which is hidden. And this is some, also at the same time, I think it's some kind of naive question, like why is everything, why is everything not just exposed and self-evident? And this kind of naivety is something which is exactly the same thing, which is like naivety is something which is obvious. So why is everything not obvious? But so it's kind of like this contradiction of like, to ask this obvious question, why is everything not obvious? So to start off with this image, which is, um, called, it's of a device which is called a detector or coherer. And these kind of two words are also something which is very important for me. So this was, we could describe it as like the first radio receiver. So the first way of making radio waves visible or radio waves within a certain part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So it's some way of like shifting the spectrum from low frequency radio waves, which we have no experience of, which are completely immaterial to basically to light or to sound. So what would happen is, I mean, this is something which I've used and made like um, working prototypes of this thing, which is kind of fun to do, but it's kind of quite precarious. And more or less the idea is that when some, uh, we have a spark, which is generating a hugely powerful low frequency emission. When the spark more or less hits this tube, the tube suddenly starts as like little amount of kind of um, metallic iron filings inside it, and these start to suddenly conduct electricity. So what it means is that if you have like a light bulb hooked up to this thing, as soon as the spark hits the thing, the light bulb lights up. So this would, you would use this for kind of early 
telegraphy, Morse code, things like this, because it's very much what it is, uh, binary. So on or, on or off. So basically it's kind of like shifting the spectrum into something visible, something audible. So it's like also the same way that we can make some kind of simple apparatus to like listen to ultrasonics from bats, which they're using to navigate, which just kind of reduce the frequency. But in this case, it's not so simple as just like shifting from one domain to another. There's something else which is happening. So it's almost like I was thinking like some kind of invisible hand is ringing because you can also attach this to some like bell apparatus. Um, so there's something which like it's not really a translation. You're not just going, you're not just shifting from one dimension to another, but it's almost like this invisible force is lighting up this um, bulb which is connected to this thing, which uh, led me to think of this quotation from James Clark Maxwell, who is also, I mean, he's one of these figures around the turn of the 19th century who was involved more or less in, yeah, he more or less like founded the equations which make radio transmission reception possible. But he's also kind of interesting because he stands at this point within the history of science where everything shifts from being imaginable and material and kind of we'll just make some experiments and we'll make these models of this thing to something which is entirely different, which is what one sort of realm that we're in nowadays. So if you <laughs> bear with me for the quotation, one second. And already the kind of the quotation is like complicated enough that it's like what the hell is going on. So he says, so he's describing kind of like a scientific way of visualizing things. <clears throat> so he says, in an ordinary belfry, so this bell ringing house, each bell has one rope which comes down through a hole in the floor to the bell, bell ringer's room. But suppose now that each rope, instead of acting on one bell, contributes to the motion of many pieces of machinery and that the motion of each piece is determined not by the motion of one rope alone, but by that of several, and suppose further that all this machinery is silent and utterly unknown to the men at the ropes who can only see as far as the holes in the floor above them. So it's basically more or less, it's kind of a, how to say, like a rather convoluted way of saying that we don't know anything about anything. But there are these ropes and you pull these ropes and you can see or hear some effect of these ropes being pulled and this is kind of how you gain some understanding of what's happening. But essentially like the nature of science is invisible. So he's not really saying the nature of things is invisible, which is kind of also the case, but the nature of science is somehow dealing with this thing which is invisible. Um, and somehow this idea, but we could also say that what he's doing, like in the 19th century, is describing like a black box, which is what these kind of technological uh, items <laughs> also embody, which is kind of... So what I became kind of interested in is like how we can take these ideas of science, of knowledge, of hiddenness, and as a kind of research object, like these technological objects or something called software becomes a way of investigating that because I can write software, I can deal with computers, I can deal with technology, and that's my way of looking at the somehow kind of hidden realm. And so here we have a slide of, uh, or a series of slides which I just showed of a haunted computer from the 1980s, or a haunted printer, actually, to be correct, uh, from somebody called Manfred Bowden. Here we have Peter Halley components, which also expresses this idea of abstraction or black boxing. So what I do is now quickly run through a list of types of hiding and how these types of hiding might have something to do with science and technology. So it's a very kind of compressed list and I look at certain things or works which I've done which somehow address these types of hiding but I don't spell it out kind of explicitly. So for example, <clears throat> we can intentionally hide uh, something so we can just make sure that it's hidden. So an example of this would be cryptography. Um, we can hide something in plain sight. So something might be in front of us that is hidden. We have this classic example of Edgar Allan Poe's uh, purloined letter where the only place that people don't look for something is right in front of their nose. Um, we have something which is hiding the very fact that it's hiding something. So we don't know, for example, within the pixels of this image, I can hide any kind of information 
and it's not apparent to you. This is called steganography. Then we can make it look as if something is hidden when it isn't. So it's kind of like a slate of hands, so we're distracting attention from something. And for example, I was thinking where we have this phenomenon called number stations, which some of you might be familiar with, where basically you have radio stations which broadcast just a series of numbers in spoken voice. So one, seven, eight, 12, 13, and in various languages, and these stations were existing for uh, years in the 80s and 90s. And my way of thinking about them was that they actually just pretend to hide something, and it's just a distraction from everything else. We can imagine that something is hidden when it's not really hidden. This is paranoia. Um, we could also say that nothing is hidden. It only appears to be hidden. And if we're enlightened enough, then these kind of veils of Maya or illusion drop, and everything is in plain sight. Um, but what I'm kind of more interested in here is somehow that hiding something becomes operational, instrumental, that it's an essential part of science, like something is an essential part of science and technology, that you can't create these things without hiding something from the user, like that's their kind of operational methodology. And there are, of course, uh, many more ways that we could think about these different kind of hidings and technology. <clears throat> How are we doing for time, actually? Yeah, okay. Good. <laughs> okay. So what I start now is looking at certain works which I've been involved in, or yeah, you know, which look at different places where this thing that is called software might be executing, as one phrase, and the way that software operates is something which is a kind of revealing and hiding at the same time. So the place that this thing called software or this kind of abstractional black box thing. Um, might be happening. So, for example, what are these places? It could be inside some kind of geological machine. So, these machines made of copper and gold and other minerals uh, extracted from the earth. That's where it could be happening, for example. Or it could be happening uh, within the human psyche, that it's some kind of exchange. It could be happening on the skin, or it could be happening in the earth itself. So this is a project called Detectors from 2012, which is essentially taking um, the same title as a Marconi detector. So there's this kind of, I started working with this idea that we're all detectives in some sense, that there's this notion of like, what does it mean to deal with these invisible phenomena? It's somehow this process of detection, and it's not too far to go from like the Marconi detector Kahira to the detective to Edgar Allan Poe to this whole, like, what is the exact action that a detective does in the world? They're trying to find something uh, hidden. So this project was basically looking at what we could call spectral ecologies, so saying there is this other world which has its own ecology, its own way of operating this world is the electromagnetic domain. So these were looking at, these were basically converting high frequency and low frequency electromagnetic emissions into sound, but more importantly, it was like, developing some kind of, uh, how do you say, like, yeah, like an ecology, like different species of sounds, different animals of sounds, different like forests of sounds in the city, in the countryside, that would relate to these electromagnetic phenomena and starting to try and uh, classify this. And also starting to try and map these across different locations. So this is in Newcastle, This is something slightly different, which is also trying to look at how um, this detection might take another form. So for example, we can start to look at the skin as being some kind of detector. So we place like sensors on the skin and use these to map different terrains to see whether they reveal something else about the landscape. This is a completely different <laughs> angle, which is trying to, so for example, there's this question of visibility. Is it necessarily always about seeing or hearing um, these hidden phenomena. So what I attempted to do here was to take processes that were happening within the machine, within the computer, and translate them onto the human skin. So it would be a completely different experience of like software. So what, what is happening here is that the, all of the kind of operational codes in opening the web browser Firefox are translated into the movement of a needle into the skin. Um, the only problem is the opening, because you have to slow everything down, so the needle is like, you know, can actually operate. So it would take 18 hours for the web browser to open. Which, yeah, it's not. <laughs> um, 
So this is kind of like a go quite fast. This is describing some other kind of revealing or invisibility, which I've started working with more recently. This was from a workshop which is called We Are Curious Children, which is a kind of play on curious, we are curious children, but also on um, Marie Curie and the kind of discovery of radioactive or the active discovery of radioactive phenomena. So this is an exposure of minerals that we were finding in Finland on photographic paper. So this is nothing, this is a whole different kind of light. Like this dark spot is made from radioactive particles interacting with the photographic emulsion. So there was no light involved. This was made in the dark over three days. This is kind of jumping back to, again, like trying to expose or reveal something which is happening within, the, um, within these technological objects. And this was a project called Diff in June, which was a publication of 2,000 pages, which showed basically what is happening within this machine from one day to the next. So it's kind of like somebody else, not me, because I'm a bit more abstract, described it as like a computer writing its own diary. So this diary of 2,000 pages, of, this, of which this is one page, basically represents like all the textual information which changed from one day to the next. And yeah, 2,000 pages and very tiny print. So it's kind of like this, uh, how to say, like this different, again, this kind of ecology or this different geology within these things. So this is a quick demonstration of the first piece which I was doing, which again is relating to this revealing of what is inside the machine as a way of looking at other kinds of revealing. revealing. <laughs> um, this was called self. So it was kind of a very primitive attempt basically for a process or piece of software within the computer to describe what it's doing, to do nothing but describe what it's doing. So each of these different colors represents um, a register within the central processing unit. So it's a certain piece of memory which is changing over time. So this is kind of, how to say, like a window into the most primitive uh, aspects of the computer. But I was interested in this idea that the program just runs to show itself running, like there's nothing else happening. This is something called Earth Code, uh, an attempt to build a computer out of Earth and somehow translate these earth signals into some computation. And this is the most recent thing <laughs> which I'm showing, which is from Sunday in Bordeaux. <clears throat> and this is a map of uh, random numbers of entropy which is something which doesn't really exist. So I've started moving towards this idea of how to say revealing things which don't exist. Something like entropy or randomness is just like a non-existent phenomena. Like rather than mapping electromagnetic fields, which are obviously always changing, you're just mapping, like simulating the toss of coins 200 times every second and walking through Bordeaux for three hours. As well as looking the green is the incidence of cosmic rays at each spot. So trying to find a correlation between these two. I mean, I became interested recently in this thing which is called uh, muon tomography, which is more or less using cosmic rays to map hidden structures. So it became very kind of popular in the 1950s. Lots of scientists and archeologists were traveling to the pyramids in Giza to try and find hidden chambers. It was kind of a way of getting you know, publicity for the you know, research, because it's kind of glossy and nice for the media, but yeah, to find hidden tombs within the pyramids because the, the cosmic rays are kind of impeded by huge amounts of stone, but they can go through these empty spaces. So the idea was here to find a kind of a non-existent empty space in Bordeaux, which I don't know, it's getting there. And then I just finish with two minutes. Good. <laughs> so I finish with the most recent um, 
research, which is something called dissolution. Um, this was part of a project in the previous slide you saw, which I won't go back to, um, based in certain gold mining locations in northern Quebec. So the kind of the central, this was informed by a kind of long standing interest in alchemy and how alchemy transitioned into kind of rationalist science, let's say. Um, <clears throat> and the kind of the notion of this work was somehow how can we take technology and dissolve it back into the earth but using only materials of the earth and of the air. So the idea was to take emblems such as these, look at how they actually do encode certain um, chemical formula and use these kind of chemical uh, experiments to then dissolve devices like this that we were also doing in the crystal world earlier. So for example, this diagram here, which has been slightly modified, is an encoding of the production of aqua regia, which is one of the only acids, or it's actually a mixture of two acids, hydrochloric and nitric acid, which is able to dissolve gold. So simply with this information, with the diagram, and with the uh, uh, text from the diagram, which I don't have time to read, um, this is telling us how we can dissolve technology using the earth, using basically materials collected from horse stables and from hair <laughs> and bone. So it's very kind of, you know, material. Uh, so also to return to the beginning of this question of uh, why is everything hidden, then we have this case. What I'm particularly interested in alchemy is that um, it deals with basically how can we access a completely hidden or somehow degraded or defaced knowledge? There's this idea of the book of nature, which was kind of something. So you would have this kind of absolute transparency at the beginning of time, let's say, for mankind with the angels and so on. Everyone can read this book of nature, but somehow through the fall of man, it becomes kind of corrupted and you can't read this thing. So it's kind of all of these. This tradition is about how you can re-access this um, degraded book of nature and return to the glory of this kind of transparency. But what's interesting is the way that it's doing this is through images and texts which make absolutely no sense whatsoever. So there are certain, um, <clears throat> there are certain techniques of encoding that are very, very complicated. So for example, when we have like mercury in the middle here representing spirit or something which is flying, so this will be the gold that is dissolved. But in the next set of emblems, he'll take another position and so it's also this way of encoding where names mean different things. This is called like Dek Naaman, was a kind of classical way of talking about this, but they don't always mean the same things. And the knowledge is also just distributed throughout the whole thing. Um, <clears throat> so just in conclusion, uh, what I think is interesting is that alchemy somehow is attempting to, to ac access this hidden knowledge <clears throat> through an esoteric language, and it's not too dissimilar to the quotation from uh, James Clark Maxwell, we have this kind of esoteric language also to access some kind of hidden knowledge. So the question still remains as to why everything is hidden. And maybe language itself is also this thing which is doing the hiding. Thank you. Well, it's going to be a tough one. Find a question <laughs> for Martin <laughs> and Ruth. Um, thank you very much. This has been uh, uh, very inspiring. Uh, we talk, you talk about signature of science or finding the signature of science, either in data or in the way they proceed to, to understand the topic. We talk about failure, asking questions rather than finding solutions and answers. What is hidden and why is everything hidden? This is a very interesting topic that could, yeah, we could use a whole forum just for that. <laughs> so thanks for the inspiration. And uh, technology using Earth. I, I think this takes me back to as a big analogy to the place where I work at CERN, and sorry for being so uh, <laughs> egotistical. <laughs> but technology using Earth is a really powerful idea, and I, I know you've been researching it for, uh, well, for your entire career, as well as 
technology as a language uh, or as a tool for science. I each of you uh, have been uh, developing tools for uh, looking at these questions, uh, either from the digital technologies, animation, film, installations that are uh, somehow interacting with uh, data or with uh, other more obscure uh, ideas related to alchemy or the interconnection or fragme the fragments of the world around us. So uh, I think, um, I don't know how to approach a question for you really. I think, <laughs> I think this is very tough because you really uh, put questions up rather than uh, responding to questions. And this is the most interesting uh, part of my job, listening to these questions and bringing them into the public. Uh, so this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to pass the microphone to the public and invite you in the 10 minutes we have left to, to express, formulate or comment uh, either questions or just reactions to what we've been talking about in the last uh, hour and 10 minutes. So, micro is open. I think uh, there is a microphone here and maybe can I ask Martin okay. a question? Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was just interested in um, the idea of alchemy. I haven't really investigated alchemy very much. This idea that there's like hidden ways to try and understand what it, the different ways that you practice it. Because um, I think of alchemy as being something that kind of anybody can do versus science as being something that's quite complicated. Is that a wrong way to think about it? trying to think of a coherent answer. I mean, I think it was... Is this on? Yeah. I think it was more or less something which anybody could do and that there was no, there was no barrier to doing this. And a lot of, like, if you look at kind of depictions, particularly in kind of... There's also... It's hard to talk about different phases. But if you look at kind of like 17th century paintings which depict alchemy, it's kind of more or less like somebody in a kitchen. Like, also, they were trying to show that the alchemists were kind of quite poor and deluded. So it would be like some guy in a corner making his experiments with, like, children running everywhere and cooking going on here in quite a poor kind of household. So it was kind of for everybody, but there was always this idea that only really the truly knowledgeable and elect could actually understand what was written in these texts. Like they were always, the knowledge was hidden, but you have to ask yourself, it wasn't hidden, like, how to say? Like the question is like, why publish it if it's hidden? It doesn't make sense. So they published it for a reason, and the reason was that it was only available to a very, mm select so like few that could understand what this encoding meant. So the knowledge itself was kind of hidden, but the but, practice and why, was... And why would they do that, though? Just so because it was an elite thing to do. They didn't want everybody doing it. Yeah, I mean, there was... It's really hard to answer. I mean, there are certain... I'm just trying to... I've no great... I mean, there are certain things to do with kind of like that it was at certain t sometimes also illegal to practice alchemy because it would lead to destabilization of currency and things like this. So if you're just kind of producing gold, so that's one aspect is the illegality. Another aspect is like to keep people from just doing something which was kind of dangerous if they don't really know what they're doing. So in some ways it does kind of parallel like contemporary science in that you can, you know, it's like it's open to everybody, but there are certain kind of barriers there. And it's hard to know what those barriers are exactly for, whether to kind of protect individuals or to protect a kind of trade or something like this or a practice. And will you be actually doing that then with the, um, the gold and the acid? Yeah, it's something I've done <laughs> many, many times. But, and it's kind of nice to do it. But this was doing this with materials collected from the gold mines and within that kind of setting that you saw of this kind of abandoned kind of gold milling station. But that's a really simple example. That's kind of, uh, the others are kind of impossible to decipher, you know. <laughs> So in the future, this idea of like the Anthropocene and that you know, we'll be able to look back and read mm -hmm. in the layers of the landscape, would it be resolvable? Would you be able to go... Does it just disappear completely, or does it... The technology, yeah. or does, you know, will you be able to understand in the future that that's... I mean, it kind of goes into... <laughs> like, it goes into solutions, so it's dissolved, but, you, but it will kind of go back. You can bring it back out again. 
So it's kind of, um, but I think uh, within the kind of alchemical examples, it was kind of a lot to do with like, what is the kind of spiritual, how to say, like how do you express spiritual actions in these kind of actions of dissolving and distilling and things rising and things falling and all of these kind of cycles, which is what I'm kind of interested in. <laughs> Any other, any other question? There is a question in the back. Hi, okay, so this is question is for Ruth Jarman. I appreciate your work very much. <laughs> You've followed for a couple of years now. And I was curious about your, I think it's the Earthworks one with the, with the layers. I was curious how you developed those visuals. Was that something that you recorded that was already being made? Or is it something that you recreated? Yeah, it was completely recreated and um, it was a really scary <laughs> piece of work to make because we've all digitally, we do a lot of computer generated animation and we've always worked with one tool which allows us to do which has allowed us to do all the things that we've wanted to do. But when we came up with this idea, we knew that we need, there was a, a specific piece of software called Houdini, which deals with particles in this amazing way, and that that's what we needed to do. So we worked with a software developer, and um, so we created an environment that was these millions of particles and that they would respond to the sound. I mean, that makes it sound very simple, but it was quite a complex kind of setup and also the kind of scale that we were dealing with. So, um, so we worked with a programmer, and um, it was the first time that we'd really done that. Um, but it worked out okay, <laughs> amazingly. Um, yeah, so it was a really, it's a really interesting process. So really, we were working with the concepts of this analog modelling, and then we reconstructed that. So you know, with a lot of our work, you can. They, they become experiences. So, for example, you can go in and you get an experience from being in that space, but you don't necessarily need to know what it is or why it is that, that you can find out or you don't even need to. So, and that's quite an important part for us, I think, in our work. And the sound that you took was the, the, the research from the volcanoes, the glaciers, yeah, that, and yeah, then they, you had the, the particles responding to that sound. Yes, exactly. So when we work, we work with um, data quite a lot, different types of data, <laughs> And um, seismic data already, you know, seismic motions through the earth already exist as waveforms. So when the seismometer collects that, it's collecting sequences of numbers, which it could be going one, two, three, four, five, three, two, one, da, 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 and then, you know, which you can directly translate into a, back into a waveform. So you can, we're always interested in staying as close to the materiality of what the data is representing as possible so that we don't try, you know, we try not to introduce anything new. When we're working with the seismic data, we have to speed it up to bring it into our audible range. But apart from that, we're directly translating it back into a waveform. And what was interesting about doing that is, for example, the glacial one, it really sounds as if you're sticking your head inside a glacier and you're, it's what you imagine sticking your head inside a glacier would sound like. Um, so there's this interesting kind of exchange that happens when you transform the data into sound. Um, and then that data, yeah, is also controlling the waveforms. You said you, you sped up the sound? So yeah, you, you have to speed up the frequency of the sound to bring it into the audible range. So everything you're hearing, um, say an event that you're hearing sort of over 10 seconds could be the result of like a like a week's worth of seismic data that's collected. Thank you. Um, so we have a couple of uh, minutes left. Questions, anyone? Oh, yeah. uh, this is a question for Ruth as well. Uh, it seems to me that uh, your art speaks about the material origin of our existence. And, and I wonder, is there a spiritual dimension to your work? Um, yeah, we get a lot of emails from people hoping that there's a spiritual dimension to our work. Um, you know, I think we're, we're driven 
as artists, both me and Joe, by our interest in landscape, physical landscape, what we can see around us and nature and experiencing nature. Um, and, and we quite often work, refer to our work as a kind of technological sublime. So we quite often reference this idea of you know, being overwhelmed by nature. So I think there is some spirituality in that, but quite often we made a piece of work called um, Magnetic Movie where we were working with interplanetary magnetic fields and brought those down into the science lab and visualised those and um, very similar to kind of where shapes come from in terms of the process. And we received a lot of people asking us if we could do the same for their aura. And um, I think a lot of those emails came from people in Southern California. And uh, so, yeah, there's this sort of funny dividing line. I guess it's about... I guess our, I don't know. It's really, it's really unclear. I think we probably give a message that, that there's this kind of spirituality going on, and we're quite open to that, but it's not a major part of our intention when we're making our work. Um, Ruth, you were uh, telling us just quickly about, I think it was the Smithsonian, where um, the scientists were kind of uh, not uh, that happy about uh, artists invading the scientific uh, space. So could you tell us a bit more about that, what happened? Um, yeah, so I can't exactly remember. I try to remember now exactly how this happened, but I know that we'd been out to Washington and we'd met somebody at the Smithsonian who runs this program called the Smithsonian Artist Research Fellowship. And the Smithsonian in America has loads of museums and research spaces all over America. And you can apply as an artist to spend time in that research lab. And I'd seen a long time ago just one photograph from the Mineral Sciences Laboratory um, of a guy sitting on top of enormous rock, like trying to saw it in half with this big machine. And I was sold, and I was like, I want to go there where they're cutting up enormous rocks and meteorites. And, and so as part of this process, we had to apply to the arts people to do the fellowship, but then we had to get in touch with the lab separately ourselves that we wanted to go into. And so I think we did this application... And they say, yes, that's fine. We'd like you to come and do the residency. Now you have to contact the lab. So I sent them the same um, kind of application. I think it was like two pages describing why we wanted to be there to um, the scientists. And Tim, who was the head of the department at the time, just wrote straight back going, I don't understand what you want to do. Because it was, you know, the art language and science language are two very different things. So I then set about writing something literally saying, we want to come and spend every day in the lab. We want to talk to the scientists. We want, you know, just the functional side. It's like, right, okay. Then he took it to the department, and they had this vote. And then we arrived, and lots of people spent a lot of time avoiding us. Um, you know, partly that's to do with the t amount of time that scientists have, and that we have to respect that time. So we'll knock on doors and try to get ourselves invited to interview them for, like, ten minutes here and there. But then gradually, as time goes on, you discover maybe they've like, been talking between them, that they've, they kind of start to enjoy talking to us. One, when we were at the Space Sciences Laboratory, there was a scientist we were talking to. He'd been, he was like in this huge lab and had this experiment in there with this vacuum chamber. And we said, can we come and talk to you about what you're doing? And we were chatting away. And then 10 minutes sort of in, he said, oh, is it OK, me, me keeping talking to you? He said, because my family don't let me talk about space science anymore. And it was at that point that we kind of realised that we had this other role when we were in labs, that, that scientists, they're, normally when they're meeting up, they're talking about science at a level that they all understand, a much higher level. And, and the only alternative is that is perhaps when press come in and talk to them. But we would go in and ask them philosophical questions or why they're interested in science or what it is they're doing, you know. And, and it would kind of fire up an excitement in them again about their work. And... And when we were at the Space Sciences Lab, which is a really good example, because that was 10 years ago, and it takes quite a long time for us to make the work, and then it feed back into the lab. And we'd made a piece of work while we were there, which was this using data from the sun, visual data, a piece called Brilliant Noise, and we showed it to the scientists. Um, you know, we felt like it was the most ridiculous thing to do, doing a presentation at the end of our residency, and we're showing them basically what they do, the work that they make. 
but we'd made this whole film of the sun and they came and watched it and loads of people came up really excited that we were kind of celebrating their science and also they normally only work say on a still image or something for like years and years studying some phenomena and there we'd brought all of this data together and so we you know it was very it's always been very much a learning process for us that we're starting we, we can enjoy it a bit more now because we understand that there's always this uncertainty for a long time and scientists can be disappointed that you don't know about their subject matter and stuff but we don't we kind of drive on through that now kind of um, emotionally it's a bit more stable <laughs> yeah can I just a quick follow-up it wasn't like you were seen as a danger in a oh. epistemological way or uh, well, it's interesting because with CERN, we, um, we, as I said, we spent the whole time we were there trying to work with some Atlas data. And um, we went through many different people, and in the end, somebody agreed. But we did have to sign a statement saying that the work we made, um, you couldn't actually extract any scientific information from it. So, um, yes, yeah, sometimes, sometimes. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I can, I can confirm that it's, it's about uh, uh, somehow protecting science, uh, so it, not, it does not become trivialized and with banal concepts, which is another way to say that uh, uh, in science uh, they don't they don't know about art, uh, it's, it's, it's not something that is familiar to them in general. Well, there are other, many people enthusiastic about arts, but not in the level of the expertise we might have. So, yeah, it's, it's about these two uh, ways of understanding uh, practice and research. So, some, it's, it's these standards of, uh, yeah, finding the right way to to do it is, is how you need to negotiate and it takes time. So um, while we are running out of time and, uh, and I think it's time to say uh, thank you. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be with you. Thank you, Martin. Thank you very much, uh, Ruth. And the both of you has, it has been marvelous. And, um, and uh, well, I hope to see you in the next sessions. Thank you. So the next session is...